All right, welcome YouTube. I am recording the first of what should be a series of a few videos on kind of introductory, um, and in this case, just more actually mid-level drafting strategy. Um, we'll be putting together some other videos that are a little more introductory in nature on playing Magic and how to draft and everything. But uh, given we are gearing up for Find Your Battlefield Aether Revolt on Sunday, February 19th. For those of you attending, um, hopefully this is a, a helpful video and looking to, to improve on your drafting strategy a little bit before the tournament on Sunday, um, or just those of you looking to learn a little bit more about how to, uh, how to draft a little bit better. Uh, making a few assumptions for our video today. Uh, first off is that you know the rules of magic, of course. Secondly is that you have drafted before, even if it's just once or twice, uh, that you're familiar with the process of drafting uh, and preferably not uh, done it a lot. So still trying to learn the basics a little bit um, and how you, know, how you go about the daunting task of picking from the many cards that are being passed to you and then building a cohesive deck uh, based on those cards that you're picking, uh, and hopefully a deck that can actually do well competitively. So those are the goals for today. Uh, again, given we are currently in the Aether Revolt set, I'll be talking specifically more about Kaladesh and Aether Revolt cards, and the format is here. Um, but I'm going to try to keep it fairly general so this draft strategy applies um, to most any draft. Um, some sets end up being a little more complex than others. Um, this being... Kaladesh Aether Revolt being uh, towards the more complex half, but certainly not one where you can't utilize basic drafting strategy um, to build a, a good cohesive deck. So, that said, let's get going a little bit. First off, drafting on its own is about deck building. You are trying to get a collection of about um, 42 cards and trying to build the best deck from those cards. Um, and then also being able to pick and choose the correct cards as they're being passed to you um, to, again, build a, a deck of roughly 23 cards um, out of those 42. So, so there is some leeway, of course, um, but you still want to make sure you have good cards that work together to in order to build your deck. So... Deck building strategy, um, however very differently than constructed or even than a sealed deck, the decisions have to be known based on a lot of unknown variables. Um, these unknown variables are what is being opened at the table, which you won't know until, um, certainly until you've seen each pack come around to you one time. And then you also don't know what cards are going to be taken. You know, you might open your pack and see what's in there, but you really don't know what other, once you make your pick, what other seven cards are going to be taken out of it by the other people at your table. So a lot of unknown variables, so it's, it's a lot more of a theoretical deck building strategy than something like a sealed deck, for example, where you have your six packs, you open them, you know exactly what you have, and then you are building a deck based on that. So, given there's so much unknown information, um, the information you do know becomes that much more important. Um, you need to know, first and foremost, what cards are in the format. Um, you need to know what, what the cards that, obviously, that you have do. You can read those. But you also need to understand and have an idea, at least, of what other cards are coming to you and what cards are going to be passed to you. In this block, for example, is an artifact block. So if you see cards that say... If you control an artifact, then blank occurs. Um, you need to know that in this set, there are many artifacts that are good, and your deck will probably end up having an artifact or two in it at the very least, if not multiple artifacts in it. Uh, and therefore, that card that gets triggered by an artifact becomes more important. So those are all things that you need to know um, going in. And there's a lot of ways of doing that. One is just studying the cards. Um, the other thing is is going through set reviews that a lot of you know podcasts or websites will put up some set reviews and, and go over each card and how good they are, um, which is another part of it that we'll get to. But understanding how good each card is on its own and how good it is in a set is a big part of it. We'll we'll touch on that in a little bit. So known information is what cards are in the set, um, and also what what cards are are good in the set. Then the other known information is what colors are being passed to you. This is one of the big, big time 
important things to or skills to be good at in draft is identifying what types of you know what colors and beyond that even what types of cards um, are being passed to you by your opponents meaning what are your opponents not taking and then assuming that you will be getting more cards of that color um, that's going to affect your pick decision and your deck building greatly because if uh, that's what's going to determine what most of your most of the better cards coming to you are going to be so being aware or being able to pick up on these subtle hints or signals as people call them as far as uh, what colors might be under drafted at the table is a hugely important part of drafting um, we'll get to that as well and then also of course what you've already picked you know that's going to affect your decision uh, certainly later in the draft if you're in the second and third pack and you've got all red and black cards you probably want to be taking more red and black cards uh, so just understanding that information and we'll, we'll get into other things like mana curve but for example if you've picked a lot of cards of a certain type already or at a certain mana cost you need to be aware of what you have already picked so that you can start taking things that are different to that um, but also things that work together with the cards you have already picked um, again we'll, we'll touch on all of this a little bit and in going into it but th that's what you do know is are, are these variables and that's what becomes very important so given all this known information um, you are making pick decisions based on a multitude of variables that we'll get into in the next slide. Um, but as you open a pack, basically what, what you're doing is looking at all these cards, um, looking at all the variables that these cards present as far as why they may be a good or a not good pick. And it does take some quick thinking. You know, you usually have a, about a minute um, to look through a pack, sometimes more, sometimes less, depending on where you're playing um, but roughly a minute to look through you know somewhere between five and 14 cards um, and decide which is the best pick out of this pack and what's the best pick for your deck so it's not all time in the world so it does take some quick being able to think on your feet um, and that's why just practice and practice and practice is a huge part of this because there's too many variables um, to expect you to, to acknowledge all of these variables quickly and efficiently uh, in a short amount of time if you haven't practiced doing that quick thinking. So the other thing to th keep in mind with all of this is, and this is how I'm going to be presenting this information, is not just what is good and what is bad. It's my goal today for you guys is to explain what are the variables you should be attentive to and what are the variables that should be making your decisions um, or should be helping you make your decision as far as what to pick. Um, a lot of picks are, are opinion based, right? There's, you might look in a pack and, and ask 10 of your friends, um, or even let's just say 10 magic professional players. Um, and, and they might in some packs, they'll come to a consensus as far as what the best pick is. Um, but oftentimes, you know, there, there's no objective right answer. So sometimes you might show a full 14 card pack to 10 pro players and, four of them might pick one card four of them might pick another card and two of them might pick another card um, and these are all you know good players it doesn't mean anyone's right or wrong it's just based on different opinions on what they think is uh what they think is better or worse given a certain set and also given just what the cards do themselves and also there's a little bit of personal bias there's always a little bit of personal bias in every pick people like to play different strategies a little bit more and so they're more likely to pick uh a card that fits that strategy than that so don't let people come and tell you that this is right or this is wrong. You know, there, um, there is no, there's no objectivity to drafting or, or rarely is there objectivity to drafting. Um, eh, I'm going to go ahead and, and no, you know, sometimes there is a, a most correct and that's where you can be objective, but still not very objective if you're just taking something that's slightly more correct than something else. So, um, you know, don't, don't let anyone bring you down and tell you made the wrong choice. Um, there are again, optimal and less optimal, but, um, there are almost no situations are there just clear cut right and wrong picks. It, it, a lot of this can be opinion based. And as long as you have a thought process as to why you chose a certain card, um, that's the biggest thing to be, to, to do while you're making these picks is, is have a thought process, have a reason why you're making this decision. Um, and then no one can really tell you that you're wrong. If, if you have reasoning, they can disagree with your reasoning, but, 
they can't disagree that you have reasoning and that's why you made a, a certain decision. Um, even if it's just, I like these types of cards better and I think I play better with these types of decks than others. I, you know, if that's, if that's what's best for you, that, that is, again, considered not necessarily best drafting strategy, but it is a drafting strategy that a lot of people do. All right, let's get into this. So what are these, what are these variables that I keep talking about that are important towards making draft decisions? Um, card quality is a, a big part of it, and that's where I was going into as far as going through these set reviews and um, you know a lot of pro teams will put together pick lists um, in terms of deciding what cards are you know, all else equal, just what cards are good and bad and better than others. And people, and this is where there's the most amount of subjectivity. Um, people can argue incessantly over which card is better than others and this card's better than this one and no, this card's better than that one. You know, people aren't going to argue. There's definitely some cards that are very, very good and no one's going to argue that the best cards are not better than some of the worst cards or the least strong cards. You know, a lot of good, good rares are going to be better than than most of your comments, for example. Um, so no one's going to make those arguments. But when it comes down to two good cards or two medium cards, um, people are going to have different opinions on what cards do. And you might have your own opinions. And if you have your own opinions and that's good, that's great. If you're looking for a little more information on you know, what, what good Magic players think um, are good cards, there's a lot of good resources out there. Uh, for example, you know, one of my favorites is, is Louis Scott Vargas for each set. Um, for limited, you know, for sealed and mostly for draft, he goes over um, all the cards in the new sets and kind of gives them grades and tell you why they are are and are not good. So that's a great way of getting more information if you're really trying to learn about the cards and and see what is good and what's not. Um, something that's been coming up more recently that's actually been uh, something I like a lot has been. Uh, videos of uh, specifically Channel Fireball has been posting these the last couple pro tours, but the pro teams having their their uh, draft meetings in terms of and they go through their pick list as far as what cards are you know ranking cards in relation to each other um, within colors and between colors and and putting together lists for themselves and and what's good about the videos is they go through and discuss why they think so and so card is better than another card and when you would or wouldn't take a certain card. If you are in this deck, you might want this card, but you're in a different deck, you'll take the other card. So these videos are pretty valuable. They're, they're, I think they could do more of this. I think this is a huge learning resource. Um, you definitely have to have a good understanding of the basics of, of the format of drafting before these videos are worth much to you uh, because they do go into some high level discussions and they talk through them quickly. Uh, but if that's something that interests you, sounds like it's up your alley, I highly recommend these videos. Um, because they're great. But I think the base level to start with is just written set reviews and, and going through descriptions of why these cards are good or not, are not good. And, and this is something that even higher level players just look at themselves because, you know, it's, you can't argue with getting advice from one of the best Magic players in history. So um, if that's your goal, then that's a good place to start as far as learning the cards and what's good. So... Card quality is important, but again, it's not something you can control. It's what's passed to you, and you know, if someone passes you a great card, there's a great card. But that's usually those great cards only come for the first few picks, and then after that, the majority of your deck is going to be built around you know the the later picks. You know, if you get maybe one to three great cards in each pack, that's less than ten of your forty cards are going to be great cards, and then you still have to build a deck around the rest of it. So. Uh, that's just, a, it is an important part, but it ends up being a small part. It, and then the, it becomes more important later on as you're deciding between, you know, those mid-level cards, what's better than other ones. And that, that again, will not be as, as subjective. That'll depend on what your deck is. So the colors. Um, if you're in the middle of your second pack and you, like I said before, if you have a black-red deck, you're clearly going to gravitate towards the black and red cards. There might be a you know, a, a very good white card, um, but you might have to take the good black card instead because that's the card that's going to go into your deck. Um, and and you want to be taking cards in your colors so that you have the most tools available to you at the end of the draft to build the best deck possible. If you're taking a variety of cards in a variety of colors, it's not really going to help you build a good cohesive deck. So 
as we said earlier, being aware of the types of cards, and I say types because it can that can matter as well, um, not just the colors, but more often it's the colors of cards that are being passed to you and what the people, meaning what the people near you are probably not drafting. It's hugely important because that's where you're going to get, if you can, you know, if people are not drafting, you're getting a lot of good red cards and a lot of good green cards, the people around you probably aren't drafting red and green, you're going to get the highest volume of red and green cards, and that's probably the deck you want to try to build. So you want to be taking the best red and green cards um, that are coming to you, and then towards the end, you should end up with more red and green cards than some other color because those are the colors that are open. Again, this is a, a very difficult skill to master. Um, and so that's something that we, we can, that takes a little more specific going into, but at the very least, for the sake of today's video, being aware of the fact that this is what you should be paying attention to is, is really my goal for today. Um, and usually it's going to be a color pair. Usually it's going to be two colors. Most draft formats, it's correct to have a two color deck. Um, you know, three can get risky and usually you can't um, get enough good cards to build a single color deck. Um, if you can, that's phenomenal, but usually it's you, you end up being more powerful if you can take the best cards from two different colors. Um, and sometimes it's, it can be correct to switch. Maybe, you know, um, this goes into other issues because in pack two, obviously you're passing in a different direction. So you're going to see different types of cards, but sometimes you might see that, you know what, this color is more open than, than I thought it was in the first pack, and it can be correct to switch, especially if you're not losing out on much. Um, I'm going to be, along with this, this instructional video, I'm going to be posting a draft video um, of me actually doing a draft and going over, the, you know, really talking through these basics. And you guys will see me do this in terms of, you know, taking a certain color card, even though I'm not in that color, because it looks like that color might be more open and it might be better off for me to, if I'm not missing out much on a color that I am going to play, to take a risk, take a very good card in a color I'm not playing and see if that color continues to be open. Um, and again, we, we talked about weighing, it's going to be a lot of variables that come into each pick. So um, colors is just one of the very var variables that go into it. And we'll, you know, I think watching, watching me draft with all of these things in mind and talking through all these things should help you guys um, than just this, this theory we're talking now. So um, be sure to check out that video. And a lot of this will make a little bit more sense since this is all pretty theoretical right now. So that's colors. Um, and the last two points, we are actually going to go into a little more in depth uh, through the rest of this video. Um, the types of spells um, is hugely important. And that'll depend on what type of deck you're drafting, whether your deck is shaping up to be very, very aggressive or a little more slow and controlling. Uh, the types of spells are going to matter more. And we'll go into that over the next few slides. Um, lastly, and probably most importantly, actually, is your mana curve. Um, we'll talk about that later, but mana curve basically means the converted mana cost of the cards in your deck. Um, and it's important that you have a variety of cards for a variety of converted mana costs so you can cast them at various points of the game. And uh, we will go into that a little more in depth. Um, in, in the coming slides. But these are these are the variables you're looking at when you're making draft picks. Um, these four categories of variables I think are the best um, the best summary of, of each thing you need to look at. And again, if you're looking at all four of these variables um, for 14 cards, it, it, it takes a while. So this is where drafting really requires some quick thinking. Um, and that's why knowing the cards going into a draft helps a lot because you're already aware of them, you know what they do, and you know how they interact with each other, then you don't have to think about that. If you don't have to think about card quality so much, it's going to help you um, now think more into the next few categories. So that's um, ways of cheating yourself into into drafting a little bit faster is, is knowing your known information already, and that's card quality, what cards exist. Um, and then again, knowing what's in your deck. If you're later in the draft, you need to know what colors you are and what types of cards you have a lot of already um, so that you can y use that information quickly. And you're not having to, uh, if you're even allowed to, in some drafts you're not allowed to look at what picks you've already made until the end of each pack. Uh, but even if you're allowed to, it takes some time to go through your cards again. Um, and that's taking time out of your draft pick. So let's go into types of spells. 
So BRED. BRED is an acronym that's often used in limited magic, specifically for sealed deck building, but uh, I think it applies heavily to drafting as well. Um, and this is just a way of prioritizing the types of spells that you want to be taking, um, that you want to be drafting. Um, and this again, this is just one of the four variables that we looked at. Uh, but this is just one thing to be attentive to as you're going through. So let's go through these, these categories and these kind of go in order, but bombs being the most important to the, the dudes and dudettes being the least crucial as far as draft picks go. Um, so bombs is kind of an all encompassing term. Um, you know, it doesn't necessarily mean a creature or a spell or enchantment or artifact. It's just, it's, it's just any card that's very, very good. And the goal, what kind of makes it a bomb and the way I would describe it best is when you play this card, if you, if you manage to draw your bomb and play it, it should significantly improve your chance to win the game. You know, whether you were already ahead, it's going to really solidify you winning. If you were behind, it's going to bring you closer to even. Um, and if you guys are even, it's going to put you firmly ahead of your opponent when you're playing this card. So it should really have an impact to the, to the outcome of a game. Um, the issue with bombs that a lot of new players mistakes that they make is that they, they really are a small, a relatively small percent of your deck. You can have one phenomenal card in your deck. Um, but in the end, that's going to be one of 40 cards and realistically, you only, you only go through about. 15 or so cards in any given magic game of limited, um, you know, 20 at the most. So that means in any given game, you have less than half 50% chance to actually draw this card, uh, let alone the fact that maybe you draw it and, and can't play, especially if it's a five or a six mana bomb, um, which oftentimes they are, you may not even get the chance to play that spell. So you can't build your decks around, or you shouldn't build a deck around a certain single bomb. You know, if you have two or three copies of, the same card or or maybe just you have a few bombs that are all do similar things then you can maybe um, more reliably, reliably expect to have that card but um, they are great to have they're hugely important to have because it kind of can give you some free wins if you get the card um, but it's not something where you can consistently expect your deck um, to have it because you don't have a very good chance in any given game to actually draw the certain card um, next up is removal, um, just getting rid of your opponent's creatures. Limited magic ends up a lot being a lot about creatures and creature combat. Um, so being able to pick and choose and remove your opponent's best creatures is a great way of making sure you stay ahead in the game. You know, keeping your creatures on the board um, and removing their best creatures is a very important part. And then the type of removal is going to is going to play a big effect. Um, what you want to have in a certain deck is not just ways of, you know, beating your opponent's bombs and having cards like uh, Tidy Conclusion and the Daring Demolition that kill any creature. Um, those cards are great, but those cards are expensive. You know, those are four and five mana black removal spells that are probably the strongest in the format currently. Um, and while they're great cards, if your deck is full of Daring Demolitions and your opponent's just playing a lot of two mana two twos, they're eventually going to play too many tutus than you are able to kill quickly uh, with those dairy demolitions and you're going to lose to those cards. Um, and that's where having something like shocks are hugely important because it costs one mana. It kills their two mana tutus. It kills their three mana three twos. Um, and you are able to quickly kill their creatures before they are able to kill you. However, the problem with playing a deck with all shocks is that as soon as your opponent plays a 3-3 three, three, or a 4-4, four, four, you're kind of in trouble because you can't kill their 3-3, three, three, their 4-4, four, four, their 5-5 five, five, um, with just your shocks. So um, that's why having a variety of removal is hugely important. You want to have good one and two mana removal spells as well as, you know, that may be less powerful and then is in combination with some four and five mana removal spells that are more powerful. Um, and that said, that's why certain cards are both cheap and can kill anything, and those are the those are the ones that become premium removal spells as you're going through. All right, so we talked about creature combat being hugely important. Um, your opponents, for the most part, all, all decks are going to have a good amount of creatures. You're going to have about, you know, somewhere in the 15 range of creatures, somewhere in the 12 to 17, to or 12 to 18 number of creatures per deck. Um, so people are going to have creatures. There's going to be creature combat. Um, and so if you're trying to pressure your opponent, which is often correct in, in limited is just 
trying to make sure your opponent is pressured and therefore they can't, they don't have all the time in the world to draw their best cards and to do what they want to do. You want to make sure you have some sort of pressure on them and therefore evasion becomes hugely important. You know, just even just creatures with flying. Um, it's as simple as that. Creatures with flying end up being very good in draft decks uh, because if you can if you can have a good flying creature and every turn you're just hitting your opponent for two or three damage, that's really going to put some pressure on them and force them to interact with you. And that's generally what you want to be doing. Um, certainly in Kaladesh and, and Aether Revolt is you want your opponent to try to react to you. Um, and uh, that's has been the case in the last few sets of limited magic that tends to be fairly correct. Not always the case. Um, and we'll, we'll go into that as well. Um, but generally you want to be pressuring your opponent so that they don't have all the time in the world. So evasion can be flying. We talked about that. Um, they are not printing as many unblockable creatures anymore, but that is a thing. Um, trample is another form of evasion um, because you are still getting damage through to your opponent. If you have a 6-6 six, six, six in play, um, your opponent can just jump block with servos and they're not taking any damage. But if that creature is trample, um, you are, you know, that if creature is effectively unblockable unless they're willing to commit a lot of creatures um, to blocking your 6-6 six, six trampler. Um, direct damage is another way. There are some creatures that um, that deal direct damage to your opponent, and that's a great way of, of that's a different form of evasion because you are damaging your opponent without having to attack and you're not letting them block at all. And then just combat tricks. Certain combat tricks can push through damage. You know, if you have a, a you know, if you have a give your creature plus two, plus two, then your 3-3 three, three that was currently before unable to block because your opponent has a 4-4, four, four, now that creature can block. And, and if your opponent blocks, you will make your guy a 5-5 five, five and you kill their creature. And if they've seen a lot of combat tricks, then your opponent may not want to block with their 4-4 four, four for fear of you having a combat trick, whether or not you actually have it. So that allows your three threes to attack into their four fours um, just by having combat tricks in your deck. So that, that can be considered a form of evasion. So next up, um, also on the pressure is just aggro, just having strong, aggressive creatures. Um, you know, again, having those combat tricks that can push damage through to try to, to kill your opponent. Um, and, uh, being able to to put pressure on your opponent even even without evasion, you know, evasive threats are not are not easy to come by in Magic. Most of the creatures are just gonna be standard ground creatures with you know some cool abilities, but um, you know, evasive threats tend to be very good. So they don't Wizards doesn't print things that are too good um, unless they're you know good on commons or rares. So just having good aggressive creatures and some combat tricks are, are important. Um, and then following this, it's just gonna be dudes and dudes. That's just just filler cards, filler filler creatures usually. Um, you know, you're not going to have a lot of evasive creatures. You're not going to have a lot of bombs. You're, um, you can take a good amount of removal, but you know, you know, to have four or five removal spells in the deck is is a lot. Um, certainly nowadays, with the amount of removal that it's in Kaladesh and Aether Revolt, um, you're usually not going to get too much more than that. So that means, you know, half of your deck is going to be mostly uh, filler creatures, um, and and it it is important to, to have creatures. So um, what I'm going to go into is, is this is the, the standard acronym. Um, my little bit of a modification um, that I think, again, not necessarily correct in this set, but in general in drafting, um, I really just cut out the aggro. I think um, your evasion ends up being enough aggro and then your dudes and dudettes can be, can be aggro. Um, so I, uh, and this is the way I learned it. And this is the way I still put together my draft decks is, is forgetting that aggro category, um, <laughs> is just and. So uh, bombs are the same, rules the same, evasion's the same. Um, evasion, you know, if you're not playing a lot of, um, you know, aggressive trampling creatures and combat tricks and everything, um, you're not a very aggressive deck, then that aggro category becomes less important. That said, your evasion becomes a little more important. Maybe you have a couple of good evasive creatures and then the rest of your deck is filler and you're putting pressure on your opponent with your evasive creatures instead. Um, in this, your that last category, that dudes, dudettes, becomes much more important. Um, and because those are the most common cards you're going to see, I, I, I find that this type of a deck be, ends up being more consistent. Um, Really what you're cutting out here is the combat tricks. I, I always like to play one or two good combat tricks. Well, almost always. 
Um, but it's not something you want to have too many of, and that's where that aggro category, I think, that's where I cut that out, is I don't want to be playing too many combat tricks because they are... Um, they're not versatile, right? They're really only good during creature combat, usually if you're attacking, sometimes if you're blocking. Um, but they are less versatile than just having another creature. Generally, you know, you can... The most important thing to do is to just have more creatures on the board. And if you're paying two or three mana for a combat trick, you could also just be playing two or three mana for a 2-2 two -two or a 2-3. Um, and often that creature might be worth more over the course of a game than that combat trick, just having an extra creature that can attack or that can block. Um, also, you don't run into the problem of sometimes you draw more combat tricks and removal spells than you need, and you don't have enough creatures, right? If those, some of those, many times you look at those combat tricks and and say, "Hell, oh, man! Like I've, you know, I've got three combat tricks in my hand, and I only have one creature, or I have no creatures. If only one of these combat tricks was a creature, you'd be better off." Um, and I find that happens much more frequently than the reverse, where you end up having more creatures in your hand and you say, oh man, I wish one of these was a combat trick. Usually you can play out your creatures and you can find things to do with those creatures during the game. Um, the other thing that that's doing is if you're not specifically looking for good aggressive creatures or looking for good combat tricks, then you can spend those draft picks on taking good solid creatures. You know, you can take three mana three threes and four mana four fours. Um, instead of taking good combat tricks early and then having to settle for three mana three twos or four mana three fours. Um, so you're using your earlier picks on that last dudes do debts category, therefore making that category a lot stronger, which again, ends up being about half your deck, maybe more sometimes. Um, and because it's the most dense category of all these types of spells, it, in my head that becomes more important because you're always going to draw a good percentage of that last category. You know that your bombs and removal, you only have a, a limited number. You may not draw them. You may only draw one of your few removal spells. Your evasive threats, same thing. You And that's, luckily, you may only need one, right? You may only need one evasive threat. You may only need one of your good removal spells. Um, but the strength of decks primarily, in my opinion, are determined by this dudes, dudettes, this final category of just having more creatures. Um, and the quality of your mid-level creatures becomes more important statistically as you're playing a game of Magic. Um, and that's and that's different than drafting used to be and than draft decks used to be. Just the way Wizards is printing cards nowadays, um, the creatures are much stronger than they used to be, and the removal is less strong than it used to be. Um, which that means is that your average creatures are going to be much stronger than previously. And in general, your average creatures are stronger than the average removal spells. So if you are filling your deck with good creatures, it's going to be hard for your opponent to deal with all those because the removal spells are not as good as they used to be. Um, you know, 10 years ago, creatures were, were were not as strong, and you had cards like Lightning Bolt and Doomblade running around everywhere that that were could kill anything and was cheap and fast. And so to spend... A lot of effort playing creatures was difficult when your opponents could remove all your creatures. That is not the case anymore. Um, it is going to be very difficult for your opponent to deal with your creatures nowadays, just based on the types of cards that Wizards have, is printing. Um, and I think you can build a strong deck just having this. And this goes back into our our colors. Is if you decide if you are able to determine what color is most open, and which not by the bombs that you're getting past, but by those mid-level cards, you want to be the color that has the most amount of good mid-level cards being passed. You want your last few picks to be good, playable mid-level cards in your color. Um, and that's a good sign that you ended up in the right color because that's where the strength of your deck is going to come in. It's going to come in depth of your creatures um, and not just by having two or three great bombs that you may not draw. So there's my soapbox. Um, I, uh, I think that's a, a more consistent way of drafting um, than, than the typical aggro. Um, category there. However, um, before you guys, those of you who know Kaladesh and Aether Revolt Limited very well, um, before you disagree too much, wh what I think is correct in this format specifically in Aether Revolt, um, I think a different category of, of deck and prioritizing is very, very viable and arguably even better in Aether Revolt um, than this category that we're currently in that I'm talking about, which is my usual favorite way to draft. Um, and I think it's this, what I've, what I've, I'm calling the beard category. Um, these are your stronger aggressive decks. 
Um, here we just change the order a little bit to where you want your evasive creatures and your strong aggressive creatures become more important than even removal um, because your goal is just to attack, 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 attack. You don't want to have a hand where you have some removal spells in your hand and not cheap early aggressive creatures. You just want to be attacking your opponent each turn. And though removal spells can help get rid of blockers, um, you know, usually if you've got strong aggressive creatures and, and you know, some of the best combat tricks that can be better and usually more mana efficient than the good removal spells. Um, and that's going to allow you to attack each and every turn. And that's effectively what you're trying to do in Aether Revolt, I think. You're just trying to, you know, if you can build the best true aggressive deck, um, you're going to have a higher chance to win just because of the types of cards that are in this set and really just a way these, these cards and, and sets all line up. Um, it's kind of hard to, to block efficiently in Aether Revolt, and so you want to be the one attacking. You know, we talked about that as far as the evasion. You want to be pressuring your opponent. I think that's even more important right now. So this is a, a whole new category of limited deck that, you know, I don't think used to be very viable, again, because the removal used to be so good years ago. Um, nowadays, if you just play good two, two mana and three mana creatures, it's going to be really, really difficult for your opponent to deal with all those creatures if they are truly good and you're playing them. Because generally at two and three mana, you're going to be playing more of them faster. You know, you play a two drop on turn two, play a three drop on turn three, you play two more two drops on turn four. Um, and at that point, your opponent maybe has only dealt with two of those four creatures and you're going to continue attacking with with your um, cheaper creatures. Um, and this may be a format, and I've, I've done this myself, where you might take a strong combat trick over a... Uh, a medium removal spell, which in, again, in these two of these categories, you'd always take a, a playable decent removal spell over a combat trick, just because that removal category is so much higher than the aggro category um, here. Um, but that may not always be the case. You know, giving a, uh, your, your attacking creature plus three plus three um, may be more important than than just getting rid of one of their, their blockers, um, because the that Pump spell ends up being a little bit of both. It makes your creature bigger, deals more damage, and it also will remove their blocker if they try to block. Um, so in these decks, the things to consider um, is, first off, is that your bombs change a little bit. You know, if a good seven mana bomb, that might be great in another deck, and maybe in the bread decks, um, in a beer deck is, is just not as good. You, you don't want to get to seven mana. You don't want the game to go that long. If, your game, if the game's going that long, you your deck's not doing what it wants to do. Um, so that becomes less important. However, um, the cheap removal spells do become more important. Um, for example, shocks become, not that there's a bomb, but that shock removal is good because it gets rid of their early creatures and allows you to play a shock, play, play a removal spell, get rid of their blocker, attack, and then play another creature at the end of turn. That's the rule becomes important. As far as bombs go, um, something like an unlicensed disintegration, which is cheap gets rid of any and you know gets rid of their best blocker and will deal them damage something like that might be considered a bomb in this type of beard deck um so a, a card like unlicensed disintegration even though it's removal i wouldn't put it in that removal category um specifically that card is a card that i would just consider a bomb in this kind of a deck and so you're taking that higher than almost any um strong evasive or aggressive creature um so Bombs are different. Your removal ends up being a little different. Again, you're, you're prioritizing different removal, and you're also prioritizing removal spells that help you attack. You know, there are certain cards that um, are, for example, cards that kill an attacking creature are less important for you because you're not worried about your opponent attacking you. You want your opponent to be attacking you um, because that means those creatures cannot block when you're attacking. And you're, what you're saying when you're building these decks is that you're going to be faster than your opponent. So they can attack you all they want, um, if you guys are both attacking each other, you're going to win the race and you're going to be the one winning. So the removal spells better allow you, better get rid of a good blocker on your opponent's side to allow um, you to block, or uh, sorry, that to allow you to attack. Um, one certain card from Kaladesh comes to mind. It's the, the rare white enchantment. I um, forget what it's called, but it's a four mana white enchantment and it doesn't let their the creature attack. And it makes your opponent have to target that creature if they target, if they play a removal spell, something like that. Which is a decent card, however, it still lets their creature block. So that removal spell is not one that you want to play at all in your aggressive deck. Um, because you're, 
using a four mana removal spell on their creature, and now their creature can still block your creatures. So it's a pretty terrible card to have in your aggressive deck. Might be good if you're a slower deck and you you know you put it on their three two flyer that's attacking you every turn, and you don't let them you don't let that creature attack you anymore, and then you can try to win the game um, at your own pace. But pretty terrible in a, in a deck like this. Um, and then as far as your filler creatures, you're just like the bombs. You want a lower curve. You want your your lower Sorry, you want your um, less important creatures to have a lower curve. You want high power um, so that they're actually dealing damage to it when they're attacking your opponent. And you want a lot of twos and three drops. You don't want, you know, mediocre five drops um, because they're you're not you're not trying to get to that point in the game. You're trying to flood your opponent with small creatures and and try to win there. So you're even though the the categories are still as such, the types of cards you're trying to get are a little bit different. So this is a, a another way of playing that I think is didn't used to be viable years ago in drafting, and I think right now is specifically in Aether Revolt is actually a much stronger type of deck than the other ones. All right, synergy decks are a little different, um, and they're not going to be a focus of mine here because it's not it's not something personally I think I'm uh, going to be the best teacher for, um, and I think there's other good examples that you can see, but. Basically, a synergy deck is different in that it's not following this typical category of taking bombs, removal, evasive creatures, um, may not follow the same, necessarily follow the same mana curve um, as a standard deck or as a normal draft deck um, because it's, it has something else in mind. It's utilizing cards that are not your usual good cards, um, and it's using those together. You know, it's kind of cards that, that aren't great individually, but... Uh, you know, the sum of their parts ends up being much stronger um, than the individual cards. Um, and it's harder to come by in draft specifically uh, because it, it you don't know all the cards that are being opened. We talked about this being, un, you know, kind of unknown information going into the draft. You might take some synergy cards, but you, maybe not all the synergy cards you need to build the correct deck are being opened at the table. Um, and so it just takes, because of this, it takes a little bit more skill to know if a deck is viable to draft and to be able to maybe start drafting a synergy-based deck, but still leave yourself open for a normal beard or bread deck um, to uh, to draft in case those cards aren't open. Um, so they they do exist. Kaladish and Aether Revolt does have a lot of good synergy decks, and those decks end up being quite strong if you can get them. Um, if uh, you guys want a good example, um, one of the better ones I've seen in Aether Revolt right now is through, I don't know if you guys... If you guys follow Aether Hub on YouTube, um, it's uh, posted by, I don't know this guy's name, um, but he's one of the guys on this Aether Hub category, and, uh, or in this Aether Hub YouTube channel. Um, but it was posted on February 8th, um, is the name of it. It's a, he drafts a pretty cool blue black improvised deck and artifact synergy deck. Um, when he's playing a lot of cards that, typically would not be very good in a normal deck, and he makes those cards um, excellent. So uh, I would take a look at that if you guys are interested in seeing what a, a good Aether Revolt Synergy deck looks like, but I'm not going to go too in-depth into that because it, it varies a lot. All right. Last and not least, and actually probably last and most important, is the mana curve. Um, you might identify your colors. You might be taking strong cards. Um, and as you start taking these cards, you have to be attentive to how these cards all look in terms of converted mana cost. So the mana curve that we talked about is is how your cards all interact along this line of converted mana cost. Um, you uh, An ideal deck is more evenly dispersed among two drops, three drops, four drops, five drops, um, and that meaning cards of that that given converted mana cost. Um, most often, having just being able to play all of your cards ends up being one of the biggest deciding factors um, in limited magic. You know, what they call curving out, um, which is really just being able to play um, something for two mana, then something for three mana on the next turn, then something for four mana on the next turn, something for five mana on the next turn. If you can do that, um, that's already going to bring your win percentage up a lot. Um, even if the cards aren't great, uh, 
just being able to play something good on each turn is hugely important. If you take a turn or two off and don't play anything, your opponent is going to be playing creatures on each turn. Or, you know, For example, they're going to play creatures on each turn, um, and they're going to be able to attack you. And if you're not playing anything early in the game or at any given turns you're playing nothing, they're going to be able to overrun you, especially in a format where these aggressive beard decks are hugely important. You want to make sure you at each... At each turn, you're playing something that can block or deal with their creatures. Um, so, again, our goal is to have a fairly even distribution um, of cards. Um, if you kind of look at this this bell curve here at the top, you are going to um, sway a little bit more towards the cheaper side. Um, you do want more twos and threes than you want fours and fives, for example. Um, and that can change format to format, right? I, this is definitely true in Kaladesh and certainly true in Aether Revolt. Um, there were formats, for example, like most recently Battle for Zendikar, where if you didn't play six and seven mana creatures, uh, you were probably going to be overrun by your opponent's Eldrazi. So um, that was, however, not a normal set. And I think in Aether Revolt, it's pretty quickly, so even more importantly, you have good twos and three drops um, to interact with your opponent. And if your opponent's not interacting, so you can start attacking them um, and hopefully win the game that way. So... This is where that bell curve is going to look more like this, where you're not going to have a lot of one drops. You're going to have a lot of twos, threes, good amount of fours, and then not many fives and sixes. And that'll kind of depend on what cards are there. Um, and this is something that also is that's hard to do. You're going to be drafting. You're going to be looking at colors. You're going to be looking at card quality, and you're gonna you're gonna see your your three one creature that costs two mana, and then you're gonna see for five mana you can get a uh, four five, or you can get a five five for five mana. Um, and you're going to look at those two cards and you're going to see a one, you know, that five, five for five mana is clearly a lot stronger than your three, one for two. Um, you know, more chance of winning the game if you play that five, five than just a three, one. And, you know, those just having those cards on the battlefield is much different. However, if you already have a good amount of five drops, then, you know, having another card that costs five mana is not going to do your deck a lot of a lot of good. You know, if all of your cards are costing four or five mana, your opponent's going to overrun you before you're even able to play um, those four and five mana creatures. Because um, you can really only play one every turn. You might just be dead or your opponent might just have an, a big advantage before you're able to play, um, you know, that third five mana creature that you have in your hand. However, if you take that two mana three one then yeah maybe now you have a five mana creature and then you also have a two mana creature and that's going to allow you to win a bigger percentage of games and that you'll have something to do early with your opponent and then you'll have something later um to do so again this is generally the way it is and and on the flip side maybe you have a lot of good two mana creatures and a good amount of good three mana creatures and you just don't have a good five mana creature well then then maybe it might be correct to take the the five mana creature be, so that your deck doesn't only end up being small creatures that cost two and three mana that the moment your opponent plays a four or five, you can no longer win in any combat because all your creatures are three ones and three twos. Um, and, and your opponent just played a four or five. So that's where at some point you want your deck to have at least a few bigger creatures um, that can interact with your opponent's bigger creatures or at the very least, some removal spells that can kill bigger creatures. Um, and that's going to be your tidy conclusions, for example. Your, your five mana kill anything because those cards can, um, even though they're not a creature, it can deal with your opponent's five fives, and then your all of your two and three mana creatures can keep attacking. So um, the, the, there's a lot to said be said to a mana curve. It's, it's, it's easier to look at afterwards. Um, you can just set all your cards, line your cards up by mana cost, and you should see this. Um, this skewed bell curve skewed towards the early side, and that's what you want to see. Um, and as we talked about, this goes for removal spells as well. You know, we talked about the shock versus daring demolition example. Of you want to make sure your removal spells line up the same. If all your removal spells are all higher converted mana cost, and your plan opponent plays a good two mana creature, then you're gonna it's gonna take you a long time before you can kill that good two mana creature. And on the flip side, if all your removal spells are too cheap, then your opponent's gonna play a six mana six six, and you're not gonna be able to kill it with all your your shocks and subtle strikes. So you want your removal spells to be along that same mana curve as well, evenly distributed. Um, and combat tricks don't count as this, right? You you can have a lot of one and two mana combat tricks, but you're not playing those on turn one and two. So those don't really count for your mana curve. Um, those sit in a different place that's a little more, a little trickier, but the easiest way to look at combat tricks is just take them out of your mana curve completely. And that's the most accurate way of representing 
you know what where combat tricks fit they don't they don't really play into your mana curve they play more into uh your you know your ratio of creatures versus removal spells and non-creature spells so um again this is hugely important and again it's it's this is where again knowing your known information knowing what cards you've already picked knowing that you've already taken a lot of two drops knowing that you've already taken a lot of four and five drops you need to be prioritizing two drops um also just knowing in a given set, are there good two drops? Um, are there good four drops and five drops? What do you need to prioritize? Because maybe you know that, um, you know, in your colors in Kaladesh, there are not many good two drops. So you need to make sure that in Aether Revolt, you take as many two drops as you can. And then in Kaladesh, you'll worry about taking your, your four and five mana uh, creatures. So, um, and again, knowing what you have already is a huge important thing. All right, so thank you, you guys who've been stick with me through all this time. I know the video is a little bit long, uh, but just a quick recap of everything we discussed. Um, four big categories of variables that I that I consider looking at when you're drafting. Um, again, the card quality is is, a, is part of it. What colors are open? What colors are your, is your deck? Um, what what you know mostly two color deck are you building? Um, what types of spells should you be looking at? Should you be, are removal spells important for your deck? Are removal spells less important? Do you want combat tricks in your deck or not? Uh, what types of creatures does your deck want? Um, and then once you spend the first, you know, early parts of your draft deciding what colors are open, what types of spells you want, then you start filling out your mana curve. Then you start seeing, all right, you know what? I got a lot of good cards, but they all cost four mana. I need to do a better, I need to start prioritizing two and three mana cards, two and three mana creatures even if they're slightly worse than the four mana creatures that are being passed to me. Because um, you can't have a deck with just all four and five mana creatures and that's just not going to work, um, or, or vice versa. Um, so after looking at all these variables, with each pick, each each and every pick is is a matter of weighing the pros and cons for each each card available to you. Um, you know, what are the pros of taking this good, this good five mana creature versus this good three mana removal spell? Uh, what are the cons of taking one or the other? What, why should I be? Why is it good for me to take this two mana three one versus this five mana four five? Um, and you're you're really having to look at all these variables and weigh all these pros and cons um, in the moment, kind of on the fly, and then make your decision. Um, and honestly, that's one of my favorite parts about drafting is it just requires quick thinking. You have to be looking at a bunch of variables. You have to decide these things um, on the fly and and. And that's where practice really, really helps to to know everything or, or to know all the variables that you're looking at and be able to make those decisions more quickly. Um, and the other thing is that it changes. You know, draft changes every time. It depends on what people open. Um, and so every draft is going to look different. Every draft deck is going to look different. And you don't really know going into it what, what colors you're going to end up, what cards you're going to see, what kind of deck you're going to build. And that ends up being a lot of fun. Um, you know, because you get to play different decks each and every time, and it, it's a choose-your-own-adventure type thing. Um, and again, we talked about this at the beginning, but even though there's, um, you know, good players can agree on what the most correct pick is, and people will argue till the end of the format what the best pick and what the best cards are, um, you know, drafting, because you're weighing so many variables and so many pros and cons, um, it's, it's, there's no way to really know what is the objectively best pick. And so I, I would venture to say there just is no objectively best pick. Um, cause you're just weighing a lot of options and it depends on which factors are more important to you as a player and as a drafter and, um, what your deck already looks like. For example, it, it's, it's really an, an opinion based decision based on all these factors of what the card you should be taking out of each and given pack. Is. So, um, it also just allows for some play flexibility. If you know that you you like to play certain cards, you know I, you can play those certain cards. Um, you might favor those. And, and again, that's not. If your goal is to win, that's a little bit different. Because if your goal is to win, you want to be taking the best cards that fit the best deck that's the most open, um, based on what people are passing you. And that's the best way to win. Um, so it really depends on what your goal is for drafting, um, and that's what's different for each set. So. On that note, thank you everybody for watching. I hope this was informative. If you have any questions, um, you can contact me uh, at IvanMTGDPT on Twitter. Um, you can message me on on Twitch or on YouTube, um, and we're going to be uh, putting together some more some more videos, um, introductory draft videos, uh, and just magic videos in general. And um, again, thanks for watching. Hope to see you guys at 
Find your battlefield, Aether Revolt, this Sunday, February 19th.